Welcome back. No discussion of the middle books of the Odyssey will be complete without a roundup of all the freaky creatures that Odysseus seems to encounter on his journeys. And first and foremost of these are, of course, the Sirens. When Odysseus comes back to the Aiaia, the land of Circe, she tells them that he has to face other adventures, scarier ones still. She tells them that he has to face the Siren. And the Siren is a creature described differently in various sources. Uh, you can see in this picture that the sirens seem to have the bodies of birds, yet they're carrying harps and have the upper bodies of women. Elsewhere, they're described like mermaids. In any event, Circe warns him that it's okay for him to hear their song if he so desires, but he can't let his other men hear it. And if he does want to hear it, he should probably be tied to the mast of his own ship and clog the ears of his men with wax. Why is this? Because they have a wonderful thing to say, and people should hear it, but it causes people to jump out of their ships and swim towards them, which would result in death. What do they have to say? Come hither, Odysseus, glory of the Achaeans, stop your ships so you can hear our voices. No one has ever sailed his black ship past here without listening to the honeyed sound of our lips. He journeys on, delighted, and knows more than before, for we know everything that the Greeks and Trojans suffered in wide Troy by the will of the gods. We know all that happens on the teeming earth. So these feminine creatures offer to tell Odysseus everything. Everything, not only that he's participated in, who doesn't like hearing his own story, but everything. And if we know anything about Odysseus, is that he's a man with great curiosity. Of course he would want to know everything. Of course he strains at the mast when his men tie him to it and tries to jump overboard and hear what it is the sirens have to say. But it's just the trap. And for a man like Odysseus, it's the perfect kind of trap. Now we'll turn our attention to the Straits of Messina. And the Straits of Messina are the straits that are in between Sicily and mainland Italy. And this is the location of the famous Scylla and Charybdis. What are the Scylla and the Charybdis? The Scylla is a monster who is described in many different ways. Here she is described as kind of spider-like. Uh, she, has, she has 12 legs and six heads and six necks. Um, she's also described as yelping like a puppy and dangling her heads into the water to pull out men who should stray into her path. Um, and here Odysseus has to make a choice because her counterpart, the Charybdis, is a whirlpool on the other side of the straits. If Odysseus steers too close to the Charybdis, he'll lose his entire ship because it'll be sucked down in a whirlpool. If he sails too far to the right, so he must sail to the right, where Vesquila is bound to kill at least six of his men, and there's nothing he can do about it. Now, Odysseus puts his men on to the dangers of the Sirens. He does not, however, mention the Scylla and the Charybdis because he knows that they'll freeze up and he doesn't want to lose everyone. At the end of Book 12, Part of the prophecy that Tiresias gives us in the underworld is fulfilled. Odysseus and his men go to the land of Thranachia, where live the immortal cattle of the sun. Um, they have an onshore breeze for many, many days, which means they can't sail away. And after a month, they begin starving. At the suggestion of Eurylochus, his men begin slaughtering the cattle of the sun and cooking them. What's different about this and the other sacrifices we've seen so far? Well, the cattle are immortal. Also, the men don't have the proper provisions for making the right kind of sacrifice. Instead of sprinkling barley grains over the head of the oxen, they sprinkle oak leaves over them. This is a no-no. Instead of pouring out wine as a libation, they pour out water. Also a no-no. So what happens when the cattle are cooked? Well, the meat that is on the spits starts moving and slithering around. The skins start crawling around on the ground. Odysseus is terrified, and he knows he's in deep, deep trouble. So the second he and his men put out to sea, they get zapped by lightning from Zeus, and his entire crew dies. He alone will survive by going back through the Scylla and the Charybdis, and will eventually land at the home of Calypso, where our story began. So what are some themes that come up in Odysseus's famous adventures in the middle books of the Odyssey? Uh, let's zero in on a couple of these for just a minute. The first of these is prophecy. What do I mean when I say prophecy? Well, the American Heritage Dictionary defines prophecy simply a, a prediction. And I think if we take this simplest definition, 
it'll be the easiest way to proceed. What kinds of prophecy do we have in the Odyssey? Let's talk about that for a minute. There are a few different kinds. There's the direct speech of the gods, as is uttered by Athena in Book 1 of the Odyssey. Here, when Athena is talking to Telemachus, Odysseus' son, she says the following, And now I will prophesy for you, as the gods put in my heart, as I think it will be, though I am no soothsayer or reader of birds. Odysseus will not be gone much longer from his native land, not even if iron chains hold him. He knows every trick there is and will think of some way to come home. So the gods often make prophecies like this in order to get someone to do something. Uh, as in the above statement when Athena is trying to get Telemachus to handle his business. Another example of this is when Hermes comes to visit Odysseus on his way to Circe's house. He tells Odysseus what to do in order to make things work out for himself. And when Odysseus does these things, things do indeed work out. And a third example of this is Circe's speech to Odysseus before he leaves her island for the second time. Here she predicts what he will go through on his adventures, and that's exactly what happens. There's a second set of prophecy in the Odyssey, and this is, this is the prophecy that comes in the form of prophetic statements and dreams. Prophetic statements, like in Book 9, when Polyphemus calls down a curse on Odysseus for blinding him. He says, Hear me, Poseidon, blue-maned earth-holder, if you were the father you claim to be, grant that Odysseus, son of Laertes, may never reach his home in Ithaca. But if he is fated to see his family again, and return to his home and own native land, may he come late, having lost all companions in another ship, and find trouble at home. This kind of prophetic statement is governed by a different set of rules. Here, the first part of Polyphemus' prophecy can't come true. We know, that since the gods have already said it, that Odysseus has to come home. Perhaps, however, if he has to come home, Perhaps he could come home in bad circumstances. And these generally seem to come true, as long as they don't contradict the direct speech of gods. Another great example of this is the prophecy that Tiresias delivers to Odysseus in the underworld. You will be marooned on Thrinacia. If you eat the cattle of the sun, you will all be destroyed or will escape, but will come home badly late in someone else's ship. Suitors will be in your house. You will kill them either openly or by trick. However, you will have to travel with an oar over your shoulder until you come to a place where someone asks you if it's a winnowing pen. There you will plant it in the ground and offer a sacrifice to Poseidon, and you will die peacefully and in prosperous circumstances. Here, Tiresias' prophecy is much more detailed than the others. Notice that it does not contradict anything the gods say, and that there are options in it. Either this or this will happen. Um, either Odysseus will be destroyed or will escape, but this third thing over here will happen. And notice that he's supposed to kill the suitors either openly or by trick. So prophetic statements must stay within the bounds of what is ordained by the gods. There's a third kind of prophecy, and that is the kind that come in the form of dreams. And the best example of this is when Athena visits Nausicaa in the form of a dream and tells her she'll be getting married soon. Um, maybe if Nausicaa will be getting married soon, but we don't know this for a fact. What we do know is that Athena wants Nausicaa to do something, and this is dream. And this dream is her way of getting her to do that. Um, so dreams are the hardest to interpret of these. Our second theme in these middle books of the Odyssey is anxiety surrounding the feminine, and I would only have to point you to Circe to get the ball rolling with this. She's beautiful. But she's also powerful and tricks men into doing things. And even in having sex with her, Odysseus has to have fear that something bad will happen to him. Uh, we later meet the sirens, who are feminine and sing a beautiful song that every man wants to hear, but it can lead to his own doom. And finally, we have the Scylla and the Charybdis, who are feminine and immortal and powerful. And there's no defense against them. The best you can hope for with these is to get hurt less. The last thing I'd like to point out in these middle books is the theme of anxiety surrounding social institutions and their correct observances. In Aeolia, we find Odysseus who meets up with people who seem to be partying in a normal way, except they're committing incest. In Lystogronia, people have houses and families like normal people, but they eat human beings. In the land of the Cyclopes, Odysseus is horrified by the fact that they have no agriculture, no trade, no crafts, no religion. 
and he doesn't understand their social institute. Lastly, with the episode involving the cattle of the sun, we see that an incorrect observance of sacrifice or an incorrect observance of proper ritual will result in death. Virtually, you shouldn't kill the cattle of the sun, but then the rituals surrounding their sacrifice are all messed up. This will surely lead to men's death. Please stay tuned for my next lecture on what Odysseus finds when he gets home and what kind of man he is.